Let's consider two examples. My goal here is not to give you a carefully worked out the example with all the details, but really to give you the general idea and save it for you as an exercise to work out the, all the details, which are very important and a great exercise in picking a coordinate system and really using all the machinery of tensor calculus to arrive at an invariant answer. But let's consider a spiral and a sine curve. And when we get to this example, I'll give you uh, two different contexts and compare the two. So when we talk about the spiral, of course, in the framework of tensor calculus, you, have, you first have to pick a coordinate system. And I will let you pick a coordinate system. But imagine there is some coordinate system that starts at zero here and increases. And let's assume that it's uniform. We can even say that it's arc length, but let's not say that it's arc length, because that would be against the spirit of tensor calculus to pick a particular coordinate system, really a Cartesian coordinate system on the curve, uh, to discuss invariant geometric objects. That's valid, just not right in the spirit of tensor calculus. So I'm just going to say uniform just for convenience. Convenience is a good argument for choosing a particular coordinate system. Maybe arc length, although not necessarily. Uh, none of this is necessary, but just to give an idea of what's going on here. And our ultimate goal is to really try and visualize the curvature normal, this invariant vector. So if the coordinate system is uniform, you can pretty much visualize what S alpha looks like, the covariant basis, in other words, that is tangent to the surface. It basically, it's the velocity vector. There is no denying that S1 is the velocity vector as the coordinate point moves along the spiral. So it goes around like this. It always points tangentially and slightly up. And it's always a constant inclination. So it goes like this, and its inclination is constant. So of course, when we get to this object, then of course you have to raise the index, and that will rescale things. But just rescale things, because it is a one-dimensional surface. So it won't change the direction. It'll just change its length to something invariant. right? But it will point horizontally, right? because the uh, the inclination up is constant. It's climbing up at a constant rate. So it'll be, this vector will be horizontal and it'll point straight to the axis of this spiral. So I guess it will look like this. And then when you uh, raise the index and contract, and of course contraction here in the one-dimensional case means adding one number. So not really anything in terms of operations except, of course, it's just the singular case of addition. You just, there's just one number. Okay, you'll end up with something like this that always points inward, and that's the curvature normal. And when we, a little bit, uh, a short while from now, focus on the one-dimensional nature of curves, this will be called the principal normal. So the principal normal is horizontal, so to speak, points straight in towards the axis. And I'll bet you its length is one over, uh, one over the radius of the spiral. One important thing to realize is that when we're talking, and this will be highlighted here in a moment, is that when we're talking about the curvature normal, there is no arbitrariness, arbitrary choice with respect to sign, because there isn't a normal. So in hypersurfaces, we had a normal, and that was defined within the sign. It could be taken in one direction or the other direction. As a result, the curvature tensor is also defined within a sign, and that sign depends on your choice of the normal. Here, you don't have a choice to make. In this whole construction, you didn't have a choice to make. So the curvature normal points in an invariant way where there is no arbitrariness. So it always points in. Nice thing to realize is if we parametrize the curve in the opposite direction, of course, S alpha would change, right? It would now be going down and pointing down, slightly down at a constant inclination. But of course, the second derivative won't change at all, because it's the second derivative. The two minuses will cancel each other, and it'll be this vector. So it's completely invariant and doesn't depend on parametrization as long as the parametrization is proper and doesn't stop and then pick up again and weird things like that. OK, so that's the spiral. Now let's talk about a sine curve. 
And this is a little bit of an interesting case. So you can talk about a sine curve in the three-dimensional space. So of course it lies in this plane, but you can ignore this fact for a moment. And we will once again talk about its curvature normal, ignoring the fact that it, acts, that it also lines in this plane. And then in this instance, we won't ignore that fact and make a little bit of a comparison. So ignoring the fact that we can once again define S alpha, which is of course a vector that just looks like this. Once again, I'm not mentioning what specific parameterization, but some sort of uniform thing. And then taking the second derivative, well, you can see which way it curves. Since it goes like this, B alpha alpha vector will point this way. And of course, it'll be highest here because the curvature, the the rate of curving, the rate of change in direction is highest. So B alpha alpha, will, the vector will be highest here, not at all here, zero. Right? Very small here, but pointing in. And then here it will be the zero vector. And then it'll point here, this, like this, and like this. All right, so. Once again, you don't have a choice of which way it points. It always points in. That's, that's its property. It always points in, and that's the curvature normal. And if you were to define the, when, once again, soon enough, we talk about curves as one-dimensional objects, and want to call this the principal normal, not so much this, but the unit length of this then the principal the vector of unit length that points in the same direction. Then the curvature normal is well defined here, but here the curvature normal is not defined at all. And once again, excuse me, the principal normal will not be defined at all. Curvature normal is perfectly well defined. It's the zero vector. And then here it turns around and starts pointing in this direction. So the principal normal here is once again perfectly well defined. And then in this inflection point again, the principal normal is undefined. The curvature normal is zero, of course. So perfectly well-defined vector, completely invariant, and captures both the rate of curving and the direction in which it's curving, and is, an, is, a, and is a completely invariant vector. And it really does pick one out of many possible normal directions. That's why later on it'll be called the principal normal because it is normal, and in some ways, it's the most special normal direction of all the normal directions. It's, of course, the direction uh, that corresponds to the acceleration of the particle moving along this curve. Once again, I omitted the fact that there is a raising of the index involved to get, uh, to get an invariant, and of course, uh, all of that depends on, the, on your choice of coordinates, just not the final result which of course is the entire point of tensor calculus. But now, let's not ignore the fact that this sinusoid also lies in this plane. Let's embrace the fact that it also lies in the plane. So of course, for the second you can once again ignore it and you'll get this complete picture. But if we now recall that it lies in the plane, then we can consider it as a hypersurface within the plane. And then it has the normal. And then the normal is arbitrary with respect to the sign. So let's choose an upward pointing normal. It's the unit vector, right? It's defined here perfectly well. The fact that there was kind of a problem here in defining the principal normal is no longer a problem here. This is a perfectly good normal, normal field. And of course, here you can define normal field and mean curvature. That's great, even though they kind of look the same, they're related, but of course there are two different objects. So this is the case, is the case we've been talking about for all, for the past, I don't know how many videos. It's the case we're familiar with, the case of the hypersurface that will have a perfectly well-defined curvature, mean curvature tensor and mean curvature and so forth. But uh, I'm not going to say anything profound anymore here, but you can also say now we, let's consider it strictly in the plane. And even though we're considering it as a curve in the plane, let's ignore the fact that it's the hypersurface. So we could still, even though it's in the plane, 
we can close our eyes to the fact that it's the hypersurface and still consider this curvature normal, which will, of course, look like this. All of these vectors lie in the same plane. And then you will actually, you can connect these two objects. And the connection will be that B alpha alpha vector, the curvature normal, equals N B alpha alpha, where N is its hypersurface normal, and B alpha alpha is its mean curvature defined as before. And even with alpha and beta, and alpha and beta here, they would still connect perfectly fine. So for a curve that is both a hypersurface, if you so choose, or not a hypersurface, if you choose to ignore that fact, you can still define both of, you can define both of these objects, and this is how they are related. In particular, dotting both sides with the normal gives this explicit expression of mean curvature in terms of the curvature normal, which is a fact that will come in very handy in the next lecture when we talk about principal curvature. So there you go. These are, these are two very vivid examples of the curvature normal and the differences between hypersurfaces and non-hypersurfaces.